So honored to be here. Um, this is the perfect stage. And I think each of the speakers today actually has uh, really done a great job of focusing on this place right here. Um, my speech today is about finding your purpose. It's about a concept I call soulfishness. And I'll go into that in a minute. Uh, but before I do, I'm gonna just give you a little background. Um, my mother was born in Cairo, Egypt. My father was a senior diplomat in the CIA, lived in England, in Germany, grew up in Washington, D.C., other than that. And uh, our family was a pair of twins. But really, what I want to share with you is less about the background I have and the journey I've been on. So what is a field goal? With that, I would like some very special people to join me my snapper and my holder. It's a great analogy for life. A field goal is a combination of a team. You start with the offensive line represented right here that snaps the ball that protects you. It's, it's essentially the community you joined, you grew up in. You didn't choose them. The holder is the next step in your development as a human being. It's about selecting the people that bring out your best. So the field goal then is a combination of the offensive line snapping to the holder, <laughs> the holder putting the ball down, and if we had insurance, I'd kick the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, let's give them a hand. Okay. The field goal to me is an analogy for all of us going through our journeys in life. It is essentially realizing that in the stadiums that we all play in, it's really about what we control right here. It's about being able to focus on what matters. And uh, if you hear an introduction to a speaker, you hear about all the success. But what I'm most proud of is that I was rejected and cut, told I wasn't good enough, humiliated 11 times by eight NFL teams. And that journey taught me so much about beginning to cut away all the distractions. The referees that might not like me, the fans cheering or shouting wonderful special messages to me. <laughs> the 11 people 22 feet away, averaging six foot five, 260 pounds, 40 inch vertical leaps, paid millions of dollars to block my kick. And yet I had to be able to stay focused and kick that little football through a pair of goalposts, which in practice looked so wide and looked like tweezers in a game. <laughs> so being able to manage that is so important. And I went through rejection after rejection on national television against the Oakland Raiders where the coach before the game said, Nick, relax, just be yourself. And I thought to myself, I don't know who I am. And that journey, like all of us go through, was having the courage to put myself out there in front of the spotlights and perform and get it done. You could argue that the kicking position is the single most pressured position in sports. It teaches you about how to get it done in our moments of truth. And I believe all of us are thinking about and talking to ourselves based on how we performed in those moments of truth. The kicker has to be able to keep his head down, do the work with that holder to trust, and absolutely be completely focused on what's here, but at the same time see the target down the road. What is that target? It is a purpose. How did I get to that? I'd like to suggest that the success we have is really about preparing ourselves from a material success to a spiritual success. Because as I made it in the NFL, I actually gave up a job working in the United States Senate for Senator Bob Packwood. Great job, all attorneys except me. And I really didn't think I was gonna make it in the NFL. And a phone call came, and I want you to think about what this is like for all of us. When we decide to try one more time. 
I got a call from Jim Schaff, never heard of him, didn't know how to spell his name. He said, the Chiefs would like to give you one more shot. And I said, thanks a lot. I've got a great job. And I hung up. And as we talk about this, we think about the process, that conversation within ourselves. I thought, what did I do? I, I didn't find out what he, what he had to offer. So I traced him back to his hospital bed. They flew me into Kansas City. They gave me a $2,500 bonus from which I, I bought a silver Scirocco, a 1977 silver Scirocco, drove out to Kansas City, gave up my job in the U.S. Senate, and proceeded, after all those rejections, to somehow have the insanity to compete against the greatest kicker in the history of the National Football League, Jan Stenerud, who would be the first kicker in the Hall of Fame. How did I get to that place? It was simply by persisting over and over and over again. So I finally made it. I beat out the greatest kicker the, in the history of the game. I had an enormous uh, amount of records early on. I was featured on 2020. I was in Sports Illustrated. Um, all sorts of things that I never thought could have happened. And I found myself in Hawaii, in the Pro Bowl, excited, on the sidelines with 17 Hall of Famers, people that were the greatest players in the history of the game. Earl Campbell, Lynn Swan, Jack Lambert. And something, something made me think I had a chance to be great. And we drove for the game-winning field goal in that game. It was surrealistic, all of these rejections, and then making it to this great island in Hawaii in this enormous game. And I kept my, my head down, and a guy named Jack Lambert came up to me, the most terrifying linebacker in the history of the game, and he said, Rookie, make this kick. We make $5,000 if you miss it, and we make 10000 if you make it. Make this kick, or I'll rip your head off. <laughs> <laughs> so I made that kick. Thank God. <laughs> and Jack Lambert ran over, embraced me, and hugged me for a good three minutes. And all the cameras were there, 17 Hall of Famers all around me. I went into the locker room, and it was special. It was surreal. It was a bucket list moment. And I'm here to tell you, as great as that was, as soon as everyone started leaving the room, I felt an emptiness. I felt something was missing. With all of that success and all of that sacrifice to make it to that place that we all want to get to, I felt an emptiness. And I realized I had not taken the time in my goals to make sure I would share that success with my parents, with the friends, with the people that would always be there with me. And from that point on, I said, if I ever make it again, I will make sure that all my goals include sharing it with everyone. And I'm lucky to say, I made it several more times, and I kicked the game-winning field goal in those games too, and my mother and father were in the front row. Oh now, why do I share that with you? Because I am here to tell you, no matter how great you are, to be in the Hall of Fame in one sense is to be a loser in another sense if we don't do that homework. Watch out for empty success. And so I began to do work in the community, and I want to share how that really transformed my life because as athletes, we're so narcissistic, so excited to get the trophies, so excited to uh, hear about ourselves, to be, you know, have all the ladies, have all the great uh, trophies of life, and yet at the same time, I felt empty. So I began a program called Kick With Nick for Cerebral Palsy. So I want to share with you that as we intentionally share our success on the field, whatever that is, in the stadium of our endeavors, if we also share that in the sense of contributing, how that finds a balance. What I discovered was a child whose very success was simply to be able to tie their shoelaces reminded me how lucky I was. My favorite word in the English language, to remind, to refresh the mind. And from there, Kick with Nick for Cerebral Palsy, we raised a million dollars. We brought a human face to children with cerebral palsy. My aunt had cerebral palsy, and it, it seemed to really bring a balance in my life. We started something then called Adult Role Models for Youth. Each one of these exercises 
in involvement transformed my life into focusing not on a Hall of Fame career, but being a Hall of Fame in the spiritual sense, finding something that really mattered much more deeply and noticing in each of us there is a file cabinet, a spiritual file cabinet that is unending and eternal that we can fill every day. And so each of those beget more experiences in being able to have an impact. And the funny thing is my career in football actually got better as well because I didn't take myself so seriously. So while I could spend most of this time talking about my career in the National Football League, the greatest blessing of all was realizing at an early age what it can mean to make a difference. So I was able to work for President H.W. Bush and President Clinton on AmeriCorps, on the Points of Light, and suddenly realizing my job is to help everyone find their purpose. My job is to make sure every day I do something that helps one person. And so that began a program called Native Vision for Native Americans. My point is in this country today, we are so lacking in the sense that the real connection we have as human beings is using our success to connect to each other. And Native Americans today have more confidence than ever before because we're beginning to reach out to them. And that program was on Oprah. Uh, it's a sports and life skills camp. Every year now for 20 years, we've been doing this program and no longer can Native American kids say, no one cares about them. So I'm here to share this message with you. This bracelet was given to me by Danny Clark on the Navajo Reservation on the 20th anniversary of Native Vision. I want to challenge all of you to make a 20 year commitment to something that will change the world, one person at a time. So many of us have the aspiration to be good. I believe all of us do. And some of us start something. A few of us make it to five years. Congratulations, that's fantastic. Some of us make it to 10 years. But if we can stick with something through all the difficulty of making a difference, we learn so much, our intuitive, spiritual insight grows profoundly, and suddenly we've taken the aspiration to be a good person, and we've actually changed the world. Because today, Native American children can no longer say that no one cares about them, that, that pro athletes, Olympic champions would never come out to the reservation for free just because they love them. So this represents to me, taking the intention to be a good person to social capital, to have truly changed the world. I want to ask all of you, what would that be for you? I have a, a slide of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel and behind uh, the image of God, one of the most famous images in the Sistine Chapel is a strange shape. And as you look more deeply, as God is literally giving power to man, we realize that it's Michelangelo's message that it's the brain. The human brain is the greatest gift, not because it's intellectual, but because it is a spiritual gift that we take all the lessons, all the missed field goals, all the embarrassments, the time when I missed three field goals, even though I was the most accurate kicker in NFL history, and there was a full page ad in the Kansas City Star with a picture of a spring coming out of my head as if I'd gone crazy. All those humiliations, all those missed field goals, all those disappointments, all those things we let people down and we turn that into something truly great by never giving up. And by the way, after those missed field goals, I actually went on to be the best kicker by an even higher percentage simply because I didn't give up. Persistence, passion, focus, but most of all, contribution and connection. I'll leave you with the stories that surround us, which is the angels, the neighbors, the mentors that make a difference. Each one of them can make a difference. Listen to them, pay attention to them. Byron White, my next door neighbor, Supreme Court Justice, led the NFL in rushing. I ended up winning the award named for him. That was not a coincidence. Joanna Hayes lecturing the Native American kids on the Apache reservation saying, you know, one of those Apache kids said, you're asking me not to give up on my dream. What was your dream? She realized it was to win a gold medal. And two years later, 
I saw her win a gold medal in the Olympics. Muhammad Ali, who can say somehow where this energy comes from that he would move in next door to me 15 years ago. And I would take him to a baseball game. And the Kansas City Royals gave him a jersey with number one and Ali on the back. The fans were just absolutely overwhelmed to have him there in that presence. A man that had stood against the Vietnam War was vilified and hated and yet now more loved and beloved perhaps than any person in the world at his time. And as we left the stadium, his Parkinson's, which was very real, shaking him, we took the golf cart from the stadium back to the car and there was a group of young people there. I was terrified that it would be too much for him. And yet, when Mohammed realized there were children there that he could inspire, his Parkinson's stopped. The most angelic look came on his face and he loved these children and took them one by one on his lap and let them know that they were special. That is a Hall of Fame human being. That is what it's all about. That is where success is transformed into something no one can take away from us. So I leave you with this thought. As you're in your stage, as you're in this place, this was my office on the field. This was what I came to realize if I took control of this, nothing else mattered. And my life could have meaning and I could help other people and I could be the best at whatever I chose to be. I challenge you to ask, what are you aiming for? And to take that Hall of Fame trophy and to put it inside yourself because that's where it belongs. It's not the brightness of the spotlight on us. It's the intensity of the light within. Thank you. Thank you.